Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that today's conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by tele telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your host, Aaron Leaf, Director at CFHI. Please go ahead. Thanks very much, Nick. Hello, and welcome to today's on-call webinar entitled, A New Reality, A New Way, Treating Major Depression and Alcohol Dependence Together. I'm Erin Leith, Director here at CFHI, and I'm pleased to be your host for this live session. Today's webinar marks the launch of our 10th season of on-call. Over the next four months, CFHI will bring together health innovators uh, each week to tell their stories so that you can join the conversation and hear firsthand accounts of improvement methods, tools, and results. As I introduce our guest speakers, I'd like, to, that, sorry, I'd like to ask that you please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box, who you are and where you're from. Joining us today are Tracy MacArthur, Senior Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer at CAMH. With more than 20 years of experience in academic health care, Ms. MacArthur is a results-oriented leader and visionary. She was an early leader in standards-based project management and led the tar largest single Cerner implementation in Canada. She also pioneered numerous regional initiatives to drive health system integration in referral management, imaging, and electronic health records. As well, we have Dr. Andre Simoska, a psychiatrist and clinical specialist scientist at CAMH. Dr. Samaklavov has an excellent track record of implementation activities that include a use of a new treatment approaches in his clinical practice and has taken an active part in developing CAMH's integrated pathway for major depressive disorders and alcohol dependence. With more than 12 years of clinical experience as a, as a psychiatrist in Canada and internationally, Dr. Slamak Samak Lavov has been a principal investigator and co-investigator, collaborator, and consultant on multiple research projects, grant proposals, and authored 63 publications working with the main focus on addictions and concurrent disorders. In 2014, he was the recipient of the Physician of the Year Award at CAMH. Finally, I would like to introduce Ms. Sema Awan, the Director of Integrated Care Pathways at CAMH. Her current role, uh, Ms. Awan, is designed, ha, has designed and developed integrated care pathways for mental health and addictions internally at CAMH and externally at other health settings. This work has been recognized by peer hospitals and provincial health agencies, and in 2016, the CAMH Integrated Care Pathways Program received the Award of Excellence in Mental Health and Quality Improvement from the Canadian College of Health Leaders. Ms. Awan has built internal and external collaborations with clinical programs, research, education, and close, works closely with clinical leadership, managers, frontline clinicians, and physicians. She holds a certification in Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, project management, and quality improvement. Sama serves on a number of hospital committees as well, and is a champion for integrating care. We also have our producers. Sheena Powell and Katrina Dumont operating behind the scenes here in Ottawa, and we're thrilled to have more than 60 uh, participants on today's session. Welcome to all of you. Just a few housekeeping items to cover before we begin today's presentation. Simultaneous interpretation is provided for all CFHI on-call webinars. Please note that this may result in a few short pauses in the dialogue today. We invite you to use either official language when entering your questions and comments in the chat box. To ensure that we get the most out of our time together, the screen has been split so that you can have both English and French presentations available at the same time. There will be a slight delay in advancing the French slide due to the in simultaneous interpretation. If at any time you wish to enlarge either presentation, simply click on the four diagonal arrows at the top right of the presentation for full screen. Please note that if you enlarge the presentation to full screen, the box will be covered temporarily. You can return to the original screen and chat by pressing the four diagonal arrows again. On today's call, we will be addressing uh, the following uh, objectives for the call. Why are care pathways so efficient in improving coordination and care for complex and at-risk populations? How has the da Vinci approach been adapted in various health settings? And why is it resonating with providers and patients and staff and how are staff being trained? 
and how has the successful implement, uh, interdisciplinary partnership approach spread across Ontario and implementing the care experience as well as the health outcomes it's resulting in for care, care, clients and families. I'd now like to hand it over to our speakers at CAMH who will get us started. Thank you very much. So this is Tracy MacArthur speaking and I'm going to speak uh, very briefly and hand it over to my colleagues so we can really get into the detail of uh, our initiative. But just by way of introduction, uh, I wanted to give you a bit of a background of CAMH and identify the context in which we're working. Uh, really at CAMH we wear four hats. So we are certainly a leader in clinical care. We're the largest academic uh, mental health and addictions hospital in Canada. But our second hat is a, is, a, is a role we play in driving research, and we like to think that we have a job uh, to serve our clients of today, but also the clients of tomorrow. Uh, we are a huge education uh, partner, and we're affiliated with a number of universities, primarily the University of Toronto, where we, where we train uh, the majority of um, psychiatrists in Ontario and a number of other health professions. And we also have a system leadership role, and we're proud to partner with a number of agencies and with the government uh, to develop policy, uh, to define evidence-based public policy, and to lead and champion a number of initiatives as part of the mental health strategy. I will let you review on your own some of the statistics around um, CAMH. Uh, but, you know, something I wanted to note is we're certainly, we have a large inpatient environment, uh, but we also have a very, very large outpatient environment relative our, to our size. And increasingly, we recognize the importance of collaborating more broadly within the community uh, in, in order to establish true multidisciplinary partnerships uh, to deal with the multitude of complexity that, that our, clients, um, our clients face. So we are based in downtown Toronto, at least that's where our two primary locations are, uh, but we also uh, are involved in communities throughout Ontario uh, through a provincial support services uh, program. We established a vision a number of years ago uh, and we're tracking uh, to, to um, complete this strategy in, in 2020. Uh, and it's really, it, it has uh, six pillars. Uh, first of all, driving uh, improved care. Uh, we certainly ha also have an interest in accountability and professional leadership in our field as an academic center. Uh, we have a huge redevelopment project to build uh, a new environment that will support a recovery-based uh, care at CAMH. And, and for any of the, you who are based in the Toronto area, you will see uh, the redeveloped facilities at our Queen and Ossington location which are predicated on, on the idea that uh, we liter literally and figuratively want to tear down the walls between our uh, clients and the community and have built an inclusive and integrated uh, campus within uh, the Queen and Ossington uh, area of the city. As I mentioned, uh, we have a huge investment in research and innovation. Uh, as well as in education, and we also play a role around uh, driving social change in the development of policy and the championing of a number of other initiatives. Uh, on, on top of this, I, for any of you who are interested in pursuing a pathway as we have, there are really two other factors I want to call to your attention that have helped us in, in our successful endeavor. The first is very much an investment in a data-driven approach to care. Uh, we've invested in a number of other initiatives that have enabled us to generate a great amount of data and to really understand our patient uh, community, our clients, uh, and, and, and what they need and have, have developed this pathway and, and several others really to serve those needs. So putting our client at the center and using data to design our interventions. Um, secondly, as I mentioned, we have a huge redevelopment initiative underway. And, and you know, th this kind of work is challenging, uh, and sometimes it benefits from a catalyst to move it forward. So I would encourage anyone to take advantage of some other major change initiatives that may be happening in your environment. In our case, it's certainly the development of some of our new facilities to embed the changes in care and the innovation in care uh, with, a, with a larger change initiative that's underway that has certainly helped us throughout our, throughout our process. I'll just end by saying uh, our integrated care pathway program uh, is, 
is fairly new. It began in 2013, uh, but we've made some great inroads that we're quite uh, proud of. Uh, again, based in the concept of um, evidence-based care uh, and developing a continuum to not only establish a pathway through an integrated approach uh, with a number of clinicians and others informing what the design should be, but also an iterative approach for testing it, for scaling it, and for moving it forward. So we hope uh, you will hear some insights into that process uh, today. And with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to my colleague. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce um, the Arctic grant briefly before I pass it on to Andre to kind of do a deeper dive in the major depression and alcohol um, use disorder treatment integrated care pathway. Um, we want to recognize the Arctic grant, which is a program that's a proven model for accelerating and implementing uh, research evidence to a broader to into broader practice and we are basically we will take you through the journey of what CAMH did with our major depression and alcohol pathway piloted and then took it to the next level which was scaling it up and hopefully you can find um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, similarities in your settings on how to utilize this um, the Arctic program um, supports and accelerates by providing uh, the infrastructure, the funding, the governance structure, and uh, it's led, co-led by uh, Health Quality Ontario and the Council of Academic Hospitals of Ontario. And uh, the Da Vinci Project was selected uh, because of a theme from the Arctic Projects in improving integration of care. Um, and um, next slide. <laughs> And just briefly, um, when we take you through our journey for the major depression and alcohol pathway, we will then kind of do a, a more of a deeper dive to illustrate how we build, we utilize this implementation machine set up by Arctic, um, driven, driven the machine with a central resource, and of course, looked at um, the expertise of the infrastructure that they had to really implement something um, fast and, um, and effectively. I'm going to pass it on to um, Dr. Samokhvalov, who can now take you through our journey for the development of the integrated care pathway. Thank you, Saima. So our DaVinci project is uh, largely based on our integrated care pathway for major depression and alcohol dependence, or alcohol use disorder now. And before we get into the implementation science, I would like to talk about integrated care pathways in general and about this particular integrated care pathway that we have developed at CAMH. <coughs> so on your slide, you can see the definition uh, for integrated care pathways. So ICP is a multidisciplinary outline of anticipated care placed in an appropriate time frame to help patients move progressively through a clinical experience to positive outcomes. As you can tell, it's kind of a broad definition, and we wanted to operationalize it at CAMH in a specific way. So each time we're developing a pathway, we want to make sure that there are several things in place. First of all, there is a clear definition of a treatment population. Whom are these people? Who are these people who are going to treat? For example, with our pathway, we would treat people who have concurrent alcohol use disorder and major depressive disorder. What are the desired outcomes and outcome measures? So for this pathway, it would be uh, remission of depression and changes in drinking patterns, and we would measure them accordingly using specific clinical scales and uh, patterns of drinking. Uh, we use the timeline follow-back scale. Uh, also, we want to define who will be the team members who will be providing care and how exactly the care will be provided. So we would provide a description of, of a team, each one, each team member's roles and responsibilities, the treatment algorithm and the decision-making process, how exactly we are making clinical decisions. And in the past two years, Commission has successfully developed and implemented nine integrated care pathways, and there are two on the way. Uh, all these pathways are developed for specific conditions and patient groups, but we will be talking about uh, the pathway that uh, was the pretty much the basis for the Vinci project. So first of all, why specifically this combination of two conditions. Uh, in the very beginning of the integrated care pathways development, we realized that we would like to develop them for conditions that are very prevalent specifically in our environment. And we realized that both conditions are very common at CAMH, 
that uh, surprisingly we have got a number of highly skilled professionals who are very comfortable treating each of these conditions separately, but they rarely address them simultaneously. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. Pretty much most of the reasons were related to the uh, roles and responsibilities of different programs. So we would have, for example, mood and anxiety program that would be happy to treat uh, patients with major depression after they have received treatment in addiction service. And addiction service would be happy to help patients with alcohol dependence, but they would defer to a psychiatrist from mood and anxiety program to take care of the depressive part. And we know from literature that it might not be the best approach. So there was no consensus on whether tr the treatment should be sequential or simultaneous. Uh, there was also no established psychotherapy manual that would complement the pharmacotherapy. There was no consensus on which medications should be chosen. We've got uh, quite a few antidepressants, around 20, 30 of them, and uh, it's pretty much up to uh, clinicians on which one to choose, and uh, there were no good guidance around that. We also looked at the population survey data and general epidemiology of, the, of these two conditions. And uh, I will use the expressions alcohol use disorder and alcohol dependence almost interchangeably here in, the, in our presentation, but uh, just because the, uh, the statistics are very similar between these two conditions. And the reason why we use two of them is because of the uh, implementation of DSM-5 that switched from that merged alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence into the alcohol use disorder. So the newest data from Canadian Community Health Survey uh, showed that pretty much every fifth Canadian will have alcohol use disorder uh, in their lifetime, and every ninth Canadian will have a major depressive episode, at least once in their lifetime, which shows us how prevalent these two conditions are. Uh, we also looked at the comorbidity data, and unfortunately, we don't have such fresh data. The information that we have is approximately 10 years old, but it still shows a very interesting tendency. Uh, you can see that if a person has one of these conditions, the prevalence of another condition is twice higher than, uh, than in general population. That actually shows that these two conditions have a lot in common, and uh, they can and usually do affect each other. We also looked at the uh, socioeconomic burden associated with these two conditions. And uh, we don't have data on concurrent disorders, but we have some information on each one of them. So I belong to a group that, research, uh, that spends a lot of time researching alcohol and related conditions. And we can testify that there are over 80 medical conditions that, that, they are, that they are actually associated with alcohol consumption. They, we're talking about number of cancers, liver problems, pa uh, pancreatitis, epilepsy, cardiovascular disease, and so on. Uh, altogether, depressive disorders account to 40% of disability-adjusted life years worldwide, and uh, alcohol use disorders account to 9% of disability-adjusted life years. And just to compare it to the all illicit substances altogether, it's pretty much the same number, 9.5% versus 10.5%. Uh, in Canada, we know that the alcohol is responsible for 37% of all socioeconomic burden, and it costs Canada $40 billion a year uh, to deal with the consequences of alcohol consumption. And as well, it takes a toll in terms of mortality. 4,000 people die in Canada each year because of the excessive alcohol use. We also looked at the KMH clinical data. We were trying to select the program that will be the host of the integrated care pathway. And uh, this is the data from Addiction Medicine Service, where we see majority of our uh, alcohol-dependent patients. And at a certain point in 2012, we decided to use and depression scale uh, to evaluate the severity of depressive symptoms. And we knew that a lot of people have depressive symptoms, but we never thought that the extent of the symptoms would be that large. And what we have learned is that 85% of our patients who have alcohol dependence, they do have some depressive symptoms, and over 60% of them have uh, moderate or severe symptoms.
So in summary, we realized that these conditions are both prevalent and highly comorbid with each other. There are some causal links, links between them. Uh, both conditions are undertreated, and we don't have a good uh, way of approaching them. We have very low treatment retention and poor treatment outcomes because of that. Uh, and uh, we indeed need some sort of a novel approach to treat them. So in order, to, in order to do this, we have gathered a large group of scientists, clinicians, administrators, project managers, and designed this pathway. Uh, this diagram shows, shows the principal, the core structure of the pathway, which is a team. So the team is centered around the client, and it includes a physician who would be um, assessing patients and prescribing them uh, medications. It, it also includes a pharmacist who would help to address a number of questions related to pharmacotherapy and help patients navigate through the side effects, uh, potential questions about it, and would monitor the compliance, which tends to be very low in this population. We do have a psychologist and therapist uh, or therapist who would be providing psychotherapy according to the specific manual that we developed. We do have a nurse who serves currently as more as a caseworker for a patient, and admin staff uh, does the administrative role and uh, helps help the patient to schedule their appointments and uh, administers the questionnaires that we use to uh, guide our cl clinical decision making. Our medication algorithm is based on a number of publications that we were able to discover during our lip search. And this is just one of them, but nevertheless, one of the major uh, publications that we actually based the pathway on. It was a big study of Helen Patinati uh, where they have used two medications, one antidepressant and uh, one anti-craving medication, sertraline and naltrexone. Uh, for treatment of concurrent depression and alcohol dependence. And what they have discovered is very well summarized in this slide. They, their discovery was that in this kind of population, patients who, do not, who receive only one medication, they do only marginally better than patients who do not, who, who do not receive anything, who do receive just two placebos. Whereas patients who receive both medications at the same time they do significantly better. And we use the outcomes of the study pretty much as a major driver for development of our medication algorithm, which implies that we are going to use both medications at the same time. Uh, it doesn't have to be specifically sertraline or naltrexone, but the patient should receive uh, an, an, an antidepressant and an anti-craving medication. Uh, so the pharmacotherapy algorithm looks like that. We've got uh, sertraline as the first choice of antidepressants, where whenever it is possible to use specifically sertraline. Second choice is afloxetine, venlafaxin, and mirtazapine. And the idea behind that is to reduce the variability. We don't want our physicians to uh, have a long list of antidepressants uh, to choose from, it, because there is no evidence that one antidepressant is better than another one. We just try to have at least one representative of each pharmacological group. So you can see that we have two SSRIs, one SNRI and uh, one NASDA, mirtazapine, and they all have uh, more or less established effectiveness in concurrent disorders. For pharmacotherapy of alcohol dependence, we used naltrexone, again, as the first choice, based on the study of Helen Patinati. And second and third choices were camprosate and tapiramate. Uh, and other uh, two other medications that were shown to be effective in alcohol dependence and are our, our, our first choices when we treat this condition. Our psychologists have developed a psychotherapy manual that consists of uh, 15 sessions. Uh, 16 sessions is a uh, wrap-up. And the idea behind the psychotherapy manual, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the idea was to introduce the CBT model, then spend several sessions uh, working on uh, alcohol use problems, primarily then switch to uh, when we achieve uh, abstinence or significant reduction in drinking, we switch to uh, cognitive focus, 
and then closer to the end of the of the uh, psychotherapy course, our patients would receive some sessions related to relapse prevention and several optional topics depending on their readiness. We started this ICP in December 2013, and right after the very first patient, we realized that it does work. Later on, at a certain point when we had 10, 15 patients, we realized that none of them has dropped out, and they all seem to be doing really well. So at a certain point, we, we started to collect the data just to see uh, if we can compare the, if we can describe the outcomes of the pathway in a very scientific way, and if possible or whenever possible, compare uh, these outcomes to, to the patient from, who received our regular treatment. So I will talk about early outcomes. Now we have a little bit uh, of more advanced uh, numbers uh, given the Da Vinci, but I'll let, I will let Saima talk about it. So uh, in the very beginning, just before we applied for Arctic, we had a cohort of patients. It was approximately after the first year of the project being operational. We had 37 patients. We had the data collected on their patterns of drinking, depressive symptoms, severity of cravings, and of course we had some information on their retention rate. Well, as we wanted to compare the data uh, to some sort of a historical controls, we have identified 92 patients from, from the same service who were also dependent on alcohol and who had some depressive symptoms. Uh, so our first discovery was the retention rate, uh, which was significantly better from what we normally observe in the clinic. If you can, you can take a look at this slide, and first thing you will see is that 50% of our patients, they normally drop out after just one month of treatment, if it is a treatment as usual whereas almost everyone in our program, in the ICP program, stayed uh, for the first month, then 90% uh, of patients stayed for the second month, and uh, pretty much four-fifths of the patients stayed for the whole duration of 16 weeks of the project. Whereas historically, uh, by that time, we would have lost almost 80% of the patients. Unfortunately, we didn't have much information of the, uh, on drinking patterns and depressive symptoms and historical controls, but we had collected pretty good data on severity of depressive symptoms, cravings, and drinking patterns in the patients uh, who were, received, were receiving treatment through the integrated care pathway. And as you can see on this slide, there was a significant reduction in severity of depressive symptoms. We used two scales back depression inventory and uh, quick inventory of depressive, depressive symptomatology. Um, both findings were statistically significant at that point. Uh, right now, when we have better data on eight, 80 patients, uh, this data look actually even better. Severity of cravings reduced slightly, uh, which which still reflects that our medic anti craving medications work, but uh, we cannot say that the severity of cravings is, uh, is, was one of our major outcome measures. It, it is one of these measures that just show that patients still have cravings, but at the same time, I will switch to the next slide. You will see that even despite having lots of cravings, our patients managed to reduce their drinking patterns. And you can see that the amount of heavy drinking days per week have had significantly reduced, uh, as well as the numbered, number of standard drinks per drinking day, which were uh, our major scientific clinical outcomes. In addition to that, we started to use the client satisfaction questionnaire just to see how, how much our patients appreciate our efforts, or if there is anything that we can that we can improve in our service. We wanted to see how the service is, per is perceived. And uh, one of the first discoveries that we had is they actually, many patients got to feel that they are part of something special. And it was indeed a very special thing at that point. It still is, uh, but it was a very new project. It, it is quite resource heavy, but our patients felt 
very special. And we even had quotes like, we're receiving a VAP treatment or Cadillac treatment. Uh, we all had a feeling that we create a very nice therapeutic alliance with our patients. Uh, we had a feeling that we know the patients really well and the patients knows us. Uh, another thing is uh, we have introduced, uh, since it is an integrated care pathway, we have introduced weekly huddles where all team members for each patient would discuss their patients with each other. And any clinician would tell you that it's usually a very interesting experience uh, because first of all, you really do get to know your patients really well. And second, it is always am amazing how much we can miss if you just see your own patient on your own. Whereas if you see a patient, then your pharmacist sees, sees the patient, your nurse sees the patient, and all of these people, they, they get some additional pieces of information that together form this puzzle of um, really successful healthcare. So when we administered this satisfaction questionnaire, um, after the first year, uh, less than half of patients were satisfied. More than the rest were very satisfied. There was a significant improvement in symptoms in 94% of patients. And when we're talking about it, it's not uh, not an actual like scientific outcome, it's more of a perception. So even people who just slightly reduce their drinking, they would feel that they have some improvement. Uh, all patients stated that the ICP changed their life in a positive way, and all patients would recommend it to a friend. Even those patients who said, who had some sort of uh, treatment-resistant depression, who were still depressed, they would still believe that the pathway actually changed their life in some positive way, and the pathway gave them some tools that would help them to navigate through their systems, through their symptoms. So the early impressions of ours were that it's a feasible approach uh, with, which has significantly higher retention rate than treatment as usual. What we noticed that the patient, and we can prove it now, demonstrate improvements on several levels, including depressive symptoms, changes in alcohol drinking patterns, and pretty much the project at that point achieved its objective and demonstrated that we can uh, use this approach and we should try to implement it more broadly. And here we switch to the Da Vinci project, which is a, an expansion of our integrated care pathway. And I'll pass the word to Saima Wan. Thank you. Um, so basically, I will take you through um, a little bit of our journey um, quickly to make sure we have some time at the end for questions. Um, so the Da Vinci Project, it stands for um, Depression and Alcoholism Validation of an Integrated Care Initiative. And, and really the goal for CAMH is um, to look at mental health and addiction and to ensure that, first of all, we are supporting and accelerating this implementation across the province with the support of the Arctic grant, and to ensure that um, we're really improving the integration of care that's required for this concurrent disorder. And if we look at any other area of medicine, such as cardiac care or cancer care, it doesn't matter where the patient will go, especially for cancer care in the province, they will, of course, get that evidence-based, uh, measurement-based care uh, for their treatment. So we wanted to kind of get the same um, thing going for uh, mental health and addictions. Um, the key objectives that we had for Da Vinci is to, one, ensure the implementation of the pathway has been redesigned um, among a, a lot of variation in terms of sites. So not everyone has the same type of um, resources or clinical settings like CAMH does. So that was one of our main goals. Um, access to evidence-based treatment for concurrent disorder, which we found that there are quite a lot of gaps, not just provincially or nationally, but also internationally when it comes to um, treating mental health and addictions together. And we just started with the depression and alcohol, but at CAMH we are, of course, looking at other concurrent disorders as well. Um, the integration piece was important because we feel that for mental health and addictions, um, it's really the team approach and the coordination of care that goes and adds value to um, the, the treatment that the patient receives. Um, effectiveness, we wanted to ensure that um, it's measurement-based care because there is new um, studies that are coming out that even for mental health and addiction, measurement-based care provide better clinical outcomes. 
And then, of course, we want to ensure that the patient is definitely in the center of this because um, that is what we found to be successful in uh, all of our pathways at KMH. So our sites across the uh, across the province that are under our Arctic program project are um, we have a very we have a, a variety we have academic health science centers community hospitals and family health teams and I will quickly go through um, the different I guess approaches we use to make this um, make this pathway adaptable in the different settings so um, we have CAMH, we have uh, University Health Network and Royal Ottawa Mental Health Centre. Um, for our community hospitals, we have North Bay Regional Health Centre, Trillium Heart Health Partners and William Osler Health System. And family health teams, we have Village Family Health Team, Inner City Family Health Team and the Hamilton Family Health Team. All of them very different with very different type of clinical settings and in this um, in, uh, in this healthcare system, our job was not to add more resources, but to utilize their current settings and see how we can implement DaVinci. We utilized a um, approach called uh, implementation science. Specifically, it's called the active implementation plan. And uh, we briefly, just going through the four stages, uh, we go in and first do the exploration stage where we understand how ready is the site, what is their current state uh, look like, um, and we do a gap analysis of their clinical needs, including capacity building for various diagnosis as assessments and treatment. We then work on work with the team and um, go through the installation process where we develop these communication structures, such as the team huddles, because we feel the interprofessional collaboration piece is very important, process redesign, and uh, also providing the specific training and in pharmacotherapy as well as non-pharmacological interventions. And then we initial do the initial implementation where we pilot it and we use quality improvement methodologies to do PDSA, plan, do, study, act, um, cycles to ensure that what we have implemented is working as well as um, doing an initial evaluation of data collection and reporting back to the team. And then once we have, we have tweaked and improved it as much as we can and is sustainable, we then complete the full implementation with, of course, providing the right type of tools, education and material as well as a sustainability plan for the various sites. And what we have found out is when we have been trying to adapt the, the clinical model that Andre went through is that there's some, there are, of course, key elements of the pathway that will never change. Um, that's the evidence-informed um, specific medication algorithm, the manualized psychotherapy intervention, which gets the most, I guess, um, value add, um, and all our therapists across the province really like it and of course the measurement-based care. Initially we were a bit worried because we are introducing a number of assessments that need to be done on, a, on, the, on the beginning of the pathway, at the end of the pathway, and periodically, but we found that when we use measurement-based care and decision-making, clinicians and physicians actually like it and it is now integrated in their care. So with these elements, which is a purple box in our slide, we then looked at what are the three different type of things we need to consider when we are implementing it in different sites. So that's where with the DaVinci project, we ended up having individual therapy option, group therapy option, and in some cases where we only have um, a solo practitioner um, in, in some of the family care settings where they don't have access to pharmacy or nursing or even a therapist, that's where we also developed the solo practitioner model, which is utilizing the manualized psychotherapy intervention. Uh, the various clinical settings that I've already mentioned, and then of course, we also had to ensure that the prescribers can be anybody that can prescribe, so not just psychiatrists, but also general practitioners, addiction medicine specialists, and in some cases, nurse practitioners. So what this did was it gave our original model a good, um, a good I guess, adaptability framework for all of these different settings, ensuring that it can fit into their clinical setting and, um, and uh, provide the best care possible for this concurrent disorder. And just to give you an example, so when we were in North Bay Regional Health Center, one of the things we realized 
as we implemented is a lot of the psychotherapy components are done in a separate clinic and a lot of the medical models for mental health and addictions are done in a separate clinic. So just integrating their team virtually through OTN team huddles provided so much more value to the patient treatment um, that um, like that's one of the key learnings that we had right from the beginning. And it actually even helped us uh, partnering that team with the community agency to ensure the case management piece with the patients that are transitioning from Da Vinci is covered. So again, when we're implementing this pathway across the province, we always have to make sure that we cannot be adding more or requiring more clinical resources because we do have to um, work with what we have. Um, and then finally, um, we also have developed community of practices because it adds a lot of value to have all of our teams regularly connect and share stories and lessons learned and, and tweak the, the protocol as we're going and also as we're developing or finding out more evidence. Um, and finally, uh, we do have a portico site um, that we utilize uh, with our small community at the moment, the provincial sites, that has information on all of our um, clinical information, medication assessment guides, news updates, as well as our knowledge exchange and forums. And moving forward, we're really hoping for Da Vinci to be the norm when it comes to treating um, depression and alcohol across the province and across the country. Um, it also got uh, recognized uh, as a leading practice by Accreditation Canada. And as, as CAMH's role um, uh, for Da Vinci, we definitely ensure regularly that the evidence that um, is uh, included in Da Vinci is, um, is uh, refreshed um, as, as often as needed. Um, so those are kind of like the next steps we're working on. We have five more months on the Arctic grant. We're focusing on evaluation, sustainability, and uh, just really meeting the ongoing demand that we get um, on a regular basis for the Da Vinci protocol to be implemented at different settings. Um, I'm going to end it there and I think pass it on for questions. Uh, I wanted to make sure we have enough time at the end, so sorry for the rush. Erin, um, should I pass it on to you now? Yes, that's great. Thank you so much, Seema. Um, so thanks to everyone and to our presenters for an excellent uh, session. Once again, we're happy to take any questions you may have, although we see several pouring in. Please continue to share those uh, questions you may have in the chat box on your screen while we start to address the questions that have already been submitted. So um, I'll start off with Maria. We, uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, we had a, pres uh, a question for Mar from Maria. And Andre, I wonder if you could address this. In terms of, uh, she's wondering about what is the age group of your participants uh, that were involved in the 30, initial 37 co uh, participant cohort? Um, thank you for this question. Uh from what, so we didn't have any like children or adolescents. Uh, I would say the age was from 20 to 67, uh, with vast majority of patients being in their 30s and 40s. And and I wonder, building on that, uh, uh, Andre, did you see a difference? I mean, it was a relatively small cohort, but have you seen any differences between somebody who's in the early 20s and and, and versus later? In, uh, in their adulthood? Um, yes, but it would be a little bit difficult to summarize it in terms of like statistical uh, outcomes. Uh, my personal impressions were that, first of all, the older patients uh, were becoming uh, the uh, more, let's say, experienced uh, mental health services uh, users there were. So, for example, the very first patient he was, I think, 62 or 63 at the time of the enrollment, and he had 30 years of uh, experience of using different services, medical withdrawal units, detoxification facilities, emergency rooms, and so on. Uh, and uh, pretty much the older the patients are, with the, with the experience of depression and alcohol, they, they are becoming more and more complex because probabilistically speaking, if their problem was addressed earlier, they wouldn't come to us. Uh, but at the certain age point, I would say after 55, when, when we were approaching the age of like 60s, early 60s, 
most of the patients that I've seen in the program actually goes beyond the 37. Um, were patients who started drinking later in life and they, they became depressed later in life. Usually it was some sort of a large uh, event happening in their late 40s, early 50s. Uh, and uh, as a result, they were not as complex as you would expect. I hope that okay, answers that's, the question. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm building on another question here. Um, I noted in the slides that, in fact, it's tremendous success. You've got 100% of clients uh, who participated in the integrated care pathway that were satisfied. And Mary Bartram is wondering, how does the collaborative client experience differ from other CAMH programs? And do you think that the difference is as a result of the program, at, given that it was better resourced, that Da Vinci is better resourced? Uh, or that was able to focus on therapeutic alliance from the team built, uh, the, you know, multi uh, interdisciplinary approach to care providing and, and team building, or rather, did you think that it was a result of integration of mental health and addictions treatment? So it is an excellent, amazing question, and it is so profound that we'll try to answer it together. So I will start, and Simon will continue. So what the difference between our way of collaboration or collaborative care from what we normally have at KMH is additional piece of structure. So every clinician at KMH is supposed to work in alliance with other healthcare professionals. So as a physician, I, I'm supposed to discuss my patients during hard health, especially more, more com complicated ones. We do have nurses who communicate with physicians if something is necessary and so on. But the key word here is if something is necessary or if patients are complex. With the integrated care pathway, we pretty much established a weekly huddle. There were like a certain point, two of them, where everyone would gather and we would discuss every single patient. And specifically this incentive, it made us realize that even patients that we consider to be Non, not too complex. They have, they bear a certain degree of complexity with them. So if as a physician in normal care, I would see a patient who is depressed and is experiencing some drinking problem, I would prescribe both, say, naltrexone and sertraline. I would monitor the outcomes. And <clears throat> without this uh, huddle, uh, I wouldn't, I might have missed number of uh, the, there are socioeconomic factors that are contributing to it, the way they respond to psychotherapy and so on. Because we have this huddle, we actually do discuss everyone and we have a way better picture. And I'm passing the word to Saima. Yeah, so um, I agree with all that. And just to, um, so going back to the question, uh, one of the things we did is uh, we did do a patient focus group before we designed the integrated care pathway. We wanted to hear from our patients from the addiction side as well as the mood side, what's working, what's not working, and they themselves provided a lot of insight in terms of how fragmented the system is even here and how they're being, you know, um, it would be great if it was integrated. So utilizing that information and not adding additional resources but then we also did work on a lot of team building um, components when we were developing the ICP with our clinical team to ensure everyone has a clear role and responsibility and everyone is purely working together as interprofessional collaboration goes. And in terms of the second question, oh, was it the integration of mental health and addiction treatment? Absolutely. That's what evidence tells us that we need to do, and this is one of our first pathways that we designed, and we are seeing good results. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to keep moving to the next question. Uh, Andre, I imagine that this will likely be a question for you. Opiates are a major concern in uh, present-day addictions. Are there any initiatives in the, wor in the works that would address opiate addictions and depression simultaneously? Thank you. It is, it is true. Opioids are a major concern. Um, there are a couple of thoughts around it. Uh, first of all, uh, addiction to opiates is 
in a way, a bit of a complication for our pathway. We designed our pathway to be very pragmatic, and we're trying to not to exclude almost anyone from the pathway. But if someone is dependent on opioids, they cannot use our first-line treatment, which is naltrexone, and it creates specific problems. But it's still uh, workable. Uh, on the other hand, if someone has opioid dependence, there are quite well-established um, opioid uh, opiate-assisted treatment programs, or OAT, uh, that are using either buprenorphine or methadone to maintain patients. And uh, they have some resemblance to integrated care pathways in a way because they are based on very well-described guidelines. And these guidelines are usually including, also including the recommendations on how to treat concurrent disorders and uh, what are the specific pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions between, say, specific antidepressants and methadone levels and so on. Um, given that, it was not on the our priority list at CAMH, uh, but... Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> sure. Let me quickly just add to that. Um, so as uh, Tracy mentioned, we're a pretty new program, um, started 2013, and we have about um, um, seven live pathways. But the, the one we're working on now is a specific one for depression. And with depression, once we've developed one for, um, for unipolar depression, we are going to actually be working uh, on branches that would actually look at uh, other uh, comorbidities that happen with depression. So this is definitely on our list. And like Andre mentioned, the opioid um, protocol that we have is already quite structured. Thank you. Okay. Um, as we move, we're going to continue to take and address questions, but Ashina, our producer here, is just going to bring up the live polls because your results are uh, very, um, your feedback is really invaluable for future webinar design, so we want to make sure we don't lose the opportunity to, uh, to get your feedback, but we're going to continue to take questions and answer those that have already been submitted. Seema, I wonder if you can speak to us a little bit about um, the insights, the emerging, I know that the program is still new, there's clearly a lot of appetite, you're spreading across Ontario, which is very exciting, and you're, you're clearly a thought leader, CAMH is, in this area, but I'm wondering about what you're seeing as early insights regarding the economic um, impact, uh, as you think about the triple aim of better health, better care, better value, what's the economic side? We heard about the socioeconomic burden of alcoholism and, and depression, um, uh, but I'm wondering if you can speak to some insights around the, you know, the economic results or, or, or even return on investment that you see for, from the uh, uh, integrated care pathway approach. Um, so it's a little too soon uh, to see actual results, but we are partnering with the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences, um, ISIS, in Ontario, to uh, basically do a further health systems analysis in about a year for all of our patients that have gone through da Vinci. Uh, but one thing that we can definitely say that uh, even though we haven't properly studied this, um, just um, an example from one of our patients, our first patient, James, who um, had been going through the, the system for 30 years, being bounced around um, and having fragmented uh, care um, and probably having a number of ED visits as well. And then he was one of our first ones to go through the Da Vinci Protocol and has been um, and has has abstained from alcohol and his depressive scales have uh, reduced. And it's been going on for about a year and a half. Um, Andre still follows him. Um, so just using him as an example, we've actually seen multiple um, patients like that uh, with these similar stories. And I think when we officially do the study and um, assess, I think um, just from lo like logically speaking, we will see that Util, like even though this pathway is quite comprehensive, it is providing care that is probably going to um, going to have much better results than uh, than what treatment as usual has been in the past. And plus, it is definitely a basis for evidence based care, which in other areas of medicine has already proven to be um, a better choice. Thanks, Seema. Um, Okay, um, before we lose our time here, I want to see if we can get through a few more of these questions. Um, 
Tanya is wondering about the virtual team huddles and how are the different practitioners incentivized to take part? Is this something that you're doing outside of their, is there, that they're participating outside of their regular practice? Um, so in terms, so we don't provide any incentive. Like I think one of the things we've realized with this Pathways work, um, along with the other um, pathways that my program runs, um, a lot of the clinicians and physicians actually come to us, and uh, they they there is such a gap in our system um, for um, treatment options for mental health and addictions that. Uh, they they participate and they take time away from their regular practice and I think Andre can speak to it as a as a frontline psychiatrist as well in terms of how he has incorporated um, ICPs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Saima. And uh, yeah, first of all, I agree with everything that Saima just said. Uh, second, as a practicing clinician, I cannot say that. I've seen anyone who would need any incentive to attend huddles and uh, to exchange the information about their patients. We, we are lucky to and very fortunate to have a very nice group of uh, very enthusiastic people. And uh, having these huddles has shown in the very beginning that how useful they are. And uh, they allow each and every single member of the, of the team to provide better care. And um, in the end of the day, it's, that's what we're striving for. So no incentive was needed. No, it was an incentive on its own. Great. OK, one, one I'm going to merge a couple questions here. And there's just a curiosity around integrated care pathway caregivers and how they are working with their case manager. Is it they're designed to work with their case manager? And are they able to potentially access uh, integrated care, care pathways by approaching their uh, their local center that may or may not work collaboratively with with CAMH. So, just to answer the very first one, so I, I think that was the question from Mike, uh, whom among the ICP I, uh, caregivers is, are designated to be case managers. In our model, it's uh, this role primarily falls on, on nurses, uh, and they are really amazing in doing this. And the second part of the question is whether people who do not have ICP program in their area can approach the centers uh, that are located close to them. Uh, I, I guess the answer would be yes, I, but we have not encountered, we are still relatively early in the process of implementing it across the province. There are quite a few centers uh, across the province, eight of them, uh, that do provide this care, and we haven't encountered this problem yet. We have encountered different kind of problem when someone is located, uh, say, in Oshawa, and it takes them an hour and a half to get to the nearest center, which would be KMH, and that becomes a problem. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, very briefly, we have one final question from Judith, and how do you train GPs to screen and treat the nature of the disease's denial and isolation? In our project, we have individual or small group sessions when myself or uh, my physician colleagues are attending meeting with small groups of physicians, and we are explaining every single aspect of the pathway the tools that we're using, how do we use them, how do we make clinical decisions, what's the rationale for this and that. And usually we have a frequently asked questions part when we, we usually answer them. Yeah, um, along with that, um, um, I think the largest group of people that have approached us has been GPs. Um, so one of the things we're doing is we're actually partnering closely with the Hamilton Family Health team um, and designing a credited course with the University of Toronto on Da Vinci where we are going to uh, provide more information on the assessment, um, the treatment options, and, uh, and, and also properly diagnosing the two, uh, two um, concurrent disorders, especially the alcohol use disorder because I do feel that, yes, it is definitely the nature of diseases, you know, um, is denial and isolation. So we want to provide more education around it. Uh, plus, we also want to ensure that we're providing information around the usage of anti-cravings, something that is underutilized um, across the country and actually internationally. So the, 
this is just part of our education strategy uh, with the GPs. Thank you so much. So I'm going to, we've actually reached time, um, but please continue to submit your questions and we will certainly pass them along to our presenters and, uh, and do our best to get back to you with responses. But I feel, you know, many of the questions uh, were, have been addressed in, in the back and forth. So, uh, but please continue to submit your questions. We're happy to receive them. So thank you very much for the excellent and engaging discussion. We hope that you found this session informative and it, and will help uh, as we continue the conversation during the upcoming two webinars. One is on October 12th when we will hear about the success and lessons from Health Canada's mental health, uh, mental wellness teams in First Nations and Inuit communities. And then again on December 5th when we will focus on improving access outcomes and satisfaction in dual diagnosis for mental health and uh, cognitive disabilities featuring the team from the, uh, the Ottawa's The Royal. The full Season 10 schedule is posted on our website and you can also sign up for the CFHI newsletter, follow us on social media and keep an eye on your email to register for an upcoming live session. A reminder to anyone that who registered for today's session will automatically receive a, an email of the on-demand version of the session including all the materials later this week. Thank you again to our presenters, and especially Tracy, uh, Andre, and Sema for their excellent presentations, uh, Sheena and, and Katrina for working behind the scenes to make the webinar happen, and of course, thank you to you, our audience, for joining us today. This does conclude today's webinar. Have a great day. <laughs>